daughter's witch, and Wendy is what? Let's talk about it. So there we'll get into some of like the official types of water, um, but really you don't need to worry too much about it. You just need to know the basics um, and of the different abbreviations you might see, and most importantly, when you might need to use what. So if you look at a typical sink in a lab, there are often two faucets. Um, the one on the right is just typically your normal tap water, and the one on the left is going to be a deionized water or DI water typically. Um, so DI water is, or DIHUO, that's typically an abbreviation for deionized water. It can also stand for distilled water. We'll get into um, these later, but these are both going to be some sort of deionized water. Distilled water, distilling is one way to deionize water. Um, and so you might see that. Um, so DH2O, that's typically talking about some sort of distilled or deionized water. Um, we, this you can use for general buffer making and things like that. You see DTH2O, that's doubly distilled water. Um, traditionally, nowadays, this is often just used to refer to other super purified water, such as Millie Q water. Um, so Millie Q is a brand name, um, but it's just like filtration systems. Sometimes it's referred to as like a polisher, um, and it's going to have different filters and things like that that are going to make this water even more pure. This water, um, this filters are pretty slow, so we typically fill the, up these carboys, um, these kind of like the things that you would see for like Gatorade or a sports game, um, but we fill them up with this Milwaukee water and then keep these by the sink. Um, so this water is going to be really good for molecular biology type applications, um, but not the really, really traditional stuff, um, but when we need larger volumes of water for things that we're doing with proteins and et cetera, um, we typically use this Milwaukee water. Um, in practice, so like, so if your lab doesn't have Milwaukee water, DI water is probably fine for most purposes. Um, we tend to use Milwaukee water basically for anything. Um, DI water we mostly just use for washing dishes, but um, Milly Q water is probably overkill for most of the applications we use it for, but because we have this filtration system and we have this water right here, um, it's safer to use the Milly Q. And so this is going to be your best bet when you need a large volume of water. Um, if you need to do some sort of molecular, like if you need molecular biology grade water, if you need or the nuclease free water, like NF. You might see this abbreviated NFH2O. This is going to be free of nucleases, so free of DNA and RNA chewers. Um, and this commonly comes in these little, um, you buy, you actually buy like little bottles of it. Um, so they can be littler or they can be bigger. But this is going to be certified to be free of nucleases. Um, and therefore you should be able to use it when you're working with DNA or RNA sensitive applications. As you might imagine, this is going to be the most expensive type of water um, and you're only getting small volumes of it. So we typically only use this when we need like just a small volume, like we're resuspending the primer or something like that. Um, then this is various things about sterility with these various forms. Um, and remember that sterility is only, something is only sterile until you stick it somewhere else. Um, so the water that comes out of the milk, you might be sterile, but then you stick it in this carboy and this carboy has something growing in it or things like that. So if you want it to be uh, more pure, you want to get it straight from the tap. And if you want to care a lot about sterility, then you're probably going to want to autoclave it. Um, so a little more detail. So the deionized water um, basically is, this is not going to be sterile. The deionization, the ion is a charged particle. So what this deionization process does is it removes those ions. It typically does this by passing the water through the charged resin. Um, so like we saw when we're doing a protein purification, we have ion exchange chromatography. Um, where we have little charged beads and then our proteins that are oppositely charged the beads and stick to the beads and then we can wash everything else off and then get our protein to unstick um, by using salt. Um, similar thing here, except we're not getting this ions to unstick, we're just getting them to stick to these little beads um, based on charge. 
So it's removing those charged particles, but it doesn't sterilize it and it doesn't remove impurities. I mean, we mostly just um, use it for, for washing, although you could use it to make buffers and things like that. It's important that it gets ionized because when you make a buffer, what you want to do is you want to be able to control the conditions. You want to be able to control what ions are in that solution. So you're making a buffer for doing some sort of electrophoresis. Electrophoresis, or gel electrophoresis is going to use electricity to send molecules traveling through a gel mesh to separate them by size. You want to be able to not like control the current, control that sort of thing, which is going to be varied if there's already ions present in the water. And so then if you're adding more ions when you add the salts, um, then you can have like too many ions and that sort of thing, and you might not get the right conditions you expect. So you want a blank slate, and so you can use the deionized water um, or um, some other form of pure water in order to do that. Um, and so the molecule water is also going to be deionized, um, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the DI water is not going to be sterile. Distilled water, distilled water is kind of like intermediate purity. It's more pure. It's also deionized. Um, but does the deionization in a different process? Um, so instead of putting it through like a filter as typically is like cheaper option, um, with deionization, it basically boils the water um, and then collects the boiled water. And because water, like pure water will have like a different boiling point, um, water will have a different boiling point than the impurities for water. So the water is going to like boil and then the other stuff is gonna be left behind. Um, and then you can collect the boiled water um, and it should be pure and sterile. Um, it, the first to do it, like to really um, effectively do it, you need to do it like at least twice since that's where you get the DDH2O or doubly distilled water. Um, and, but this is still not going to be super, 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 super pure. And if you want it super, 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 super pure, um, then you need to go through another step. Um, typically we, to refer to, so like I said, this like DDH2O, if you see DDH2O, you typically, we just use the smelly key water and this is typically often used as shorthand for the smelly key water or a similar filtration system for this ultra pure water. Um, and so even if it uses a different method, um, if you see DDH2O, turn to the smelly key or similar. Um, these, so this water, um, it's been through this like in-house filtration system. So here you can see this is a really big one. Um, we also have a smaller one in my lab. At the end, there's going to be a little spigot. You might see sometimes these are connected directly to a sink and you can get it right out of the spigot. Um, but typically we fill up these carboys because the purification system goes pretty slow. Um, and again, you want to make sure that if you really need to, if you're doing something really sensitive, maybe you're working with RNAs, you're making a buffer for making an R, running an RNA gel, um, you might want to take it directly from the spigot rather than from the carboy, um, and also keep that spigot um, covered up with its little plastic container. You know, is it can be kind of jerky when it starts and stops? So if you're like I wouldn't recommend like actually trying to like fill a graduated cylinder at the end like to try to get it to align instead what I typically do is fill it up most of the way and then use like a pipette or pour from a little like um falcon tube of the pure water to get to the line um to like don't rely on it stopping like right in time um because it can like have a little bit of a delay it should be sterile initially, um, but if you really need sterility, you care a lot about that, you want to autoclave it. So the autoclave is like this super high pressure um, oven sauna thing. It's very sterilized with steam. Um, this is going to kill microbes, but it's not going to kill RNAs. Um, so RNAs are super duper hardy. Um, they can survive the autoclave. Um, so RNAs A is one of worry about or similar um, RNAs A types. Um, it can survive autoclaving. It has a ton of disulfide bridges and things, so it's super duper sturdy. And autoclaving isn't going to get rid of it. So if we really need water to be super pure, if we need a large volume of it, what we can do is we can treat it with this chemical called DEPC. Basically, DEPC acts as a decoy 
So if the RNA is A and it's active site, it has these systems and it goes through this mechanism where it gets the RNAs um, to prime OH to attack itself um, and get cut. That C kind of prevents, pretends to be RNA um, and the depth C goes to cut it, but it gets stuck on there. And when you treat with depth C, you then have to autoclave things to deactivate the deep depth C so that it's not just going to destroy and inactivate all the molecules in your solution because it's not very specific. Um, it'll kind of just attack things and get stuck on there. So you need to autoclave it to destroy the depth C. When this happens, though, you can get some various byproducts that might inhibit future enzymatic activity. Um, and so um, it's typically safest to get non depth -C treated nuclease-free water um, when you get options. When we talk about this nuclease-free water, there's often options you can get depth -C treated or non depth -C treated. And typically, you'll just want to get the non depth -C treated um, to prevent any interference. So this water is really good for when you just need small volumes of things um, to respend primers or RNA samples, DNA samples, things like this, where you really care about them being um, protected from nucleases. And again, they're only, they're only pure in three of those nucleases until you open the bottle. When you open the bottle, you're gonna um, one of these really good um, practices Filter tips, if possible, when I'm working with RNA, I typically label a water and just use it for RNA and only use filter tips for that um, bottle and things like that. Um, when I use these, I also like to like look up and shine them against the light, make sure nothing's floating in there before I go to use it. Um, and then periodically get a new bottle. Um, so yeah, so this will be like certified free from nucleases. There are various different brand names and things like that, but it'll have something that says like ultra pure or bio, a molecular biology grade or something like that. But the bottom line is you're probably most of the time safest just using this milliq, unless like I said, it's some sort of small volume thing um, with RNA or DNA, in which case you'd want to go to that ultra pure water that you actually buy in that in the little container so you don't have to worry about it having that in like cardboard or gone through the spigot or things like that um, and you know it's certified to be free from RNAs and DNAs. Um, also with like these filters there could you need to periodically change the filters and so if the filter wasn't changed it could be a problem. Um, one way that you can know if the filter is working is by like checking it'll show like the resistance. I'll get more into that in a minute. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll get more into it now. Um, so sometimes you might see water talked about in terms of its conductivity, so how well it conducts electricity or its resistivity. Um, so how well it prevents the flow of electricity. So electricity is the flow of ions, so charged particles. So the more ions there are in the water, the higher the conductivity and the lower the resistivity. Um, as we talked about, like deionization gets rid of ions. So if the deionization is more thorough, the conductivity is going to be lower and the resistivity is going to be higher. So if you have ultra pure water, it's going to have really high resistivity. So typically when you look at, at one of those really pure, pure things, you want to see that the resistivity is greater than like 18 um, mega ohms per centimeter and, and the conductivity is less than one micro some S for some I'm not sure. Um, you also might see water purity talked about in terms of total organic content, TOC. So if you think about microbes, things like that, those are going to be organic. Um, you have the carbon and hydrogen. Um, and so if you have a high TOC, this might be something growing in there. If you have a low, really low TOC, there probably aren't any microbes present. And so there's actually official water quality types um, with different criteria for these different factors um, to that meet um, these standards. Um, so this like ASTM uh, sets these distinct standards for these different types of types of water. Um, and so type one is going to be your ultra pure water, something like the middle or similar that you're used for molecular biology experiments when you're working with nucleic acids, when you're doing sensitive measurements, maybe HPLC, something like that. Um, when you are various things like that. Um, type two is gonna be pure, this is gonna be like deionized, can be used for non-critical buffer making, et cetera. Um, type three is gonna be the second lowest grade, um, with only slightly better than type four, which is which, which, 
which is better though than type four, which is the least pure. Um, but still, you're only going to be wanting to use these guys for like washing and things like that. Um, speaking of washing, what I do is I actually typically I wash first in just like normal tap water. Um, then I wash in it, rinse it off with the ionized water and then I rinse it off. Um, so I do like scrub dub dub with the normal water and soap, um, then like three rinses with the deionized water and then three rinses with the super pure water. Um, you don't want any sort of salts or that sort of thing getting caked on to the glassware or the plasticware. Um, so it's going to wash it off with the deionized or the ultra pure as well. Um, but yeah, so with these different types of water, um, so often with these lower quality waters, they're just um, purified using this technique called reverse osmosis. So you might see this term RO, um, RO water. Um, so basically osmosis is where water is going to move from the place with the least solute concentration to the place with the higher solute concentration, which has an effect of kind of like diluting out the solute. What's really happening is that there's more water molecules effectively like the water concentration is higher over here. So it's gonna to go to where the water concentration is lower because there's more water molecules over here. They're more likely to, by chance, wander over to this side. Um, if you have a membrane that the solute can't get through. So the semi-permeable membrane. This generates this thing called osmotic pressure. Um, and basically if you apply that amount of osmotic, of the amount of pressure that that's osmotic pressure generated, push the water back through the other direction. Um, and so then you can get the water away from the solutes. And so this can be used to help purify water. Um, there are also different types of purifications that can be technically used for these different types of water. And you can learn more about them at the provided links in the comments. Um, but remember the bottom line, you really, really don't need to worry about it too much. Um, all these different types and specifications. Um, just know that when you see like DDH2 or something, just typically go for the milliq. If something doesn't specify, typically just go for the milliq. It's going to be your safest bet. If you don't have one of those, you're probably good with the DI water most of the time. And you really don't want to use that tap water for much of anything other than washing. Although there might be specific applications where something might say um, to don't use deionized water or something because you need some ions in their presence. I remember I came across that like one place or something in undergrad, I don't remember where it was, but typically you're adding the ions yourself when you're adding the salt solutions. And when you're doing it in that way, then you can have a defined ion concentration. So hope that helped you understand what's going on. Um, yeah, and then also, if, yeah, if you're doing small like PCR, phase, things like that, you can play acids, um, go for that. Um, store-bought stuff, but most things are probably fine with the smelly key water. Um, and yeah, I hope that helps.